Good evening and welcome to tonight's Five by Fifteen. And I couldn't be more thrilled to be being joined by Karen Armstrong, the extraordinary writer on religion and spirituality and religious thought all across the world. Karen has had an extraordinary life. Um, she spent seven years as a Roman Catholic nun, but she left her, her order in 1969 while she was reading English at Oxford, in fact, in her fourth term. And that's an experience that she writes about in a book called Through the Narrow Gate, which was the first of the 16 books that she has gone on to write. Her books have included The Battle for God, Muhammad the Prophet for Our Time, and very famously, The History of God. But they're all rich and interesting and chart her life and her extraordinary intelligence and her great curiosity about man and religion and spirituality, which is probably more important. Sacred Nature, and I have to say the cover is really as beautiful as that slide showed at the beginning. Um, it's really lovely. It makes you want to dive in, and I can tell you it is worth diving in. It sets out to challenge the way that religions across the world relate to or understand, or in some cases indeed don't understand, the significance and the deep importance of the natural world. Now, the subtitle of this book is How We Can Recover Our Bond with the Natural World. That's where we're going to start in a minute. But just let me say that the format is that Karen and I will talk for 40, 45 minutes. Please put your questions for her in the Q&A box and we'll come to as many as we can. And please buy the book. Books are available from our bookseller, New and Books, and the details of the book and everything will, as always, be in the chat box. So let me start, as I say, by, by your subtitle, because how we can recover our bond with the natural world, of course, tells us that that bond is broken. Well, it, it is broken and, and we're getting having we're seeing this every day in the news. Uh, the hideous uh, weather we had last week, for example shows that climate change is, is, is definitely on the rise and uh, as well as the, the hideous fires that there were, there were in southern, southern Europe. So this, this is, but somehow uh, we are not being moved by this emotionally. Um, we hear about the science and we hear about, uh, you know, all, all these uh, emissions and things that are going wrong. Um, but we don't, we're not uh, inspired. We, if, if we feel anything, we feel afraid, uh, but we don't quite know what to do about it. Um, and it came to me that uh, we are, we've lost that bond with the natural world. We started losing it as early as the 15th century. Um, and we went off in a quite, different direction from the other great uh, cultures uh, in China, um, in India, for example. Um, and what, what fascinated me in my research was that, uh, that, the, that there seems to have been an almost archetypal notion of nature. Uh, you have uh, both the Chinese and the people of India with have no contact with one another whatsoever producing a very similar view of the sacred. They don't envisage a God up in the heavens as we do, uh, overseeing everything from afar. Uh, for them, the ultimate reality is a force, a sacred force that is um, absolutely beyond our, our imagination in a way. It's both physical and spiritual. Uh, it's, uh, it's continually roiling and producing more and more things. It produces the gods, uh, as well as uh, all the things of nature and human beings. Um, and uh, it, 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 uh, we find it cropping up to this, cropping up to even in Judaism, which has a completely different view. Judaism and Christianity, instead of seeing the divine in nature, saw it in historical events in like the exodus from Egypt or the, um, or, or the life of Jesus Christ. But, um, but, but when um, the, the, but in, in Jewish Kabbalah, the mystical Judaism, 
they produce something very, very similar uh, to this uh, emanation uh, force uh, that God itself it emana uh, um, has, it has to produce from, from itself, mm -hmm. uh, sort of em as an emanation, the world that we have it, uh, getting, uh, getting further and further away from God. And that, that's, that was similarly the, the, the case in Islam, which has a much better view of nature than either Judaism or Christianity. Uh, so um, I, I was struck by this, uh, as it were, archetypal notion. And what was even more interesting to me was that uh, when uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge, two romantic poets in the early 19th century, uh, started were very, very worried about our separation from nature. And uh, in Tintin Abbey, um, Wordsworth uh, comes up with a, a view of nature that is exactly like what the Chinese call qi, what the uh, Indians call rita. Uh, that it, 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 he says, he says, I have learned, he says, to look on nature. We, he taught himself to look at nature differently, and that's what we've got to do. I've learned to look at nature, not as, not as it was when I was a, a young boy and it was all luxurious, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh, nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. And that's almost a perfect <coughs> poetic description of chi or rita, or the, the other ancient uh, views of, of, of the, the ultimate reality that keeps us all in existence. So that was wonderful. It's wonderful to hear the, the Wordsworth. And, and of course, he would have been not uh, dealing with a situation where the planet was being abused by man. But you, the two things here to talk about. One is going back and saying that, um, the, the, the religions, the Judeo-Christians, are the only religion that have a single God. God, you know, we say God the Father who art in heaven. Mm -hmm. And there is this notion of one person up there yes. overseeing it all, having created it all, and to a great extent, what people feel is it has been given to man to do what he wants with. How does that accord with a I don't know, a benign, a, a religion that kind of loves people. It, it always seems very harsh and full of punishment. And indeed, we have punished the earth. And it, it, in the very first chapter of Genesis, we have a sort of a rather punishing God. I mean, we have the fall of Adam. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, and God tells Adam uh, to take the earth and subdue it. Yes, um, it, and that's what uh, people in the 17th century, people like Bacon, said. That's what we must do. That's what God told us to do: to to take the earth and subdue it. And Adam failed to live up to that. Uh, he sinned. But now, now we here in Europe can subdue the earth. Um, and um, that's that was quite something quite quite different uh, from from the other religious traditions. Um, interestingly, however, the Greek Orthodox uh, retained much of their pagan view of nature. For them, Artemis, the god of nature, was one of the principal uh, deities worshipped. And she was invisible, but she was everywhere, in every plant, in every cloud, in every river. Um, and that was carried through, I think, that, that remained the Greek Orthodox. Uh, it was rather funny when the, 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 when the Western Christians and pilgrims were coming over in the 12th, 13th centuries 
to the Holy Land, as they call it, where Jesus had lived and died, they would fall on their faces and kiss the ground and cry out, oh, the holiness of this land. And the Greek Orthodox were saying, what on earth's the matter with them? Then they understand all land was holy. Their land is holy, just as holy as ours. Um, and uh, there, we, there we saw that, 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 that sort of divergence uh, that we went off in, in this very, very different direction. Um, and, in, and of course, then we started to exploit nature as Bacon said, thought said we must do. Um, and um, Descartes yeah. said, let us make sure that we never have any cause to wonder at nature anymore. Uh, he said, we, 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 uh, we, we, we never look at nature and think how, how marvelous it is. Uh, when we look at a cloud, we'll no longer be filled with awe uh, because we'll know exactly why that cloud is, is, is as it is. And the, the, this mystery is gone. And God, he said, is up there in the heavens, said Descartes. Uh, he sets things up like a machine. And he says that all the uh, things of nature, said Descartes, were just like the machines that people were producing at that time, clocks and fountains. Um, that, uh, that, 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 but they had, there was nothing holy about them. Uh, we, it was, they, were, they were just something that we must now exploit for our own benefit. So, but that sense of exploitation and our right to exploit extended beyond just stuff in the earth, didn't it? Because that was a colonialism, that was attempt to convert people, that gave you moral justification for slavery, for when, say, you know, the Pilgrim Fathers went into America to be able to look at the American, the indigenous people as savages, because somehow God had given them a superiority. Yes, that, 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 is, that is definitely what happened. Um, and, um, and we did take the earth and we did subdue it as, as well, uh, imperially, as well as, um, as, well as in, in environmentally. Um, do, as Newton saw God as a dominator, dominatrix, and, and we took that with us into our colonies uh, when we when we set up our empires, and that and we of course uh, of course our use of nature, uh, uh, abuse of nature, I should say, uh, has we we planted it there in the colonies too, and and we find now that say China, for example, which had a very, very strong religious tradition uh, to, of uh, reverence for nature, um, subduing the earth just as we have. But there is interestingly, uh, quite an important um, Confucian movement going on in China among leading scholars at the moment. I don't think they've got on, they're mainly dealing with politics but I, I, I that they should be getting in touch with, with the whole Confucian view of nature too, because the Chinese had a very, very wonderful tradition of uh, the, the sacrality of nature. And, and also the sense that uh, you didn't have to have one guiding uh, force. So if you go back, as your book does, through different chapters of the, of the big religions, and maybe we can just talk a bit about each of them and then try to bring this round to what we can personally do to try to reconnect. Um, in China, as you say, that they they felt an animation in the whole world. Yes, um, and it, uh, interestingly, chi chi the Chinese were the first to enunciate the golden rule, which became absolutely central to every single world religion. Confucius was one who enunciated it first, uh, do not impose on others, he said, what you yourself do not desire. A couple of centuries later, Mencius, the great Confucian, said, yeah, that's fine, but now that goes, applies to nature too. Mm -hmm. uh, what they call the wanwu, the thousand things of nature or the myriad things of nature. Now, our word thing uh, suggests something rather sort of d dead, mm -hmm. uh, non-active, but not in China, the one Wu are all alive, pregnant with life. So is a person a thing in that context as yes. much as the plant is a thing? 
a plant is a thing and, and all are holy. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and your job is to uh, apply the golden rule, said Bencius, to the things of nature, they're the things of nature, just as we do for human beings and treat them as we would wish to be treated ourselves. Um, and, and, and later the, the, in the uh, 9th and 10th centuries, the, 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 the Neo-Confucians did a really wonderful movement uh, where they said it was important to look into the principle of every single flower, every single cloud, every single clod of earth, every, every single one of this has, has a, a sacred dimension um, and, and, and must be revered. And the th things of nature alongside the human being, the, the, and the, because the the two are conjoined, we we depend upon upon them, um, and um, and 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 had to have to treat them as we would wish to be treated ourselves. Do they have an origin story? An origin story. Because most most religions do have an origin story. Yeah, they're not so interested in that. Um, what? There, what, I, what the Chinese were interested in from the very, very beginning. Um, it, it, the, well, the origin, of course, was in the qi, the qi, or, uh, the, the force that comes into being and, and produces it. And of course, you have in, the Taoists mm -hmm. uh, present, show how the Tao is constantly churning and uh, bringing life to things and then things die and they go back into the earth and they, they come back again in, in this cycle. The Chinese were very much aware of the forces of nature um, and, and realized that, but, but they, they went out of their way to, uh, to inculcate, they saw heaven, earth and humanity as forming a sacred triad, as it were a partnership of three sacred beings, all on the same level. Um, and um, they also, from a very, very early date in the, some of the er earliest, um, the, some of the very earliest texts in China had this vision, not of focusing on China or their homeland, but reaching out to the entire world and the entire cosmos, um, that you began, life uh you had to and, and chinese people were taught to, you began to respect people in the family and every single member of the family had to look after one member of the family the younger son had to take care of this son who was a, a little bit ahead of him mm -hmm. the older son had to look after his parents and it was a really serious business they you really waited on these people and, and revered them uh, but you didn't stop there, because then you had to extend your sympathy to the city. Once, you, once you'd acquired your sense of duty and affection for every single one of the family, uh, then you went, moved out to the city. Uh, then you moved out to the whole country. And finally, to the whole world. And they had this constant sense of reaching out in, 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 in concentric church circles from the self out into the world and that world of course included uh, the heavens and the earth and the trees and and the plants uh, as as well uh, so they had this this uh, uh, whereas our um notion of spirituality is very much going down deep within um and if you look at the uh, the buddha he always seems to be looking in in order to achieve enlightenment but not so because the indians too said that uh, enlightenment comes not from gazing within at your with at your own soul and polishing your own soul but reaching out to everything and everybody and they say that the, the buddha is said to have uh, sent out start uh, rather like the concentric circles first reaching out to everybody uh, in, 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 one part of, in one part of the earth, but and not leaving that, that quarter of the earth until he had expressed affection for every single creature and every single human being in it. And when he had finally broken down the, the selfishness and, <clears throat> and reached out in concern for others, including the things of nature, uh, then he achieved enlightenment.
Um, and I think, uh, you know, because our spirituality tends to be very much polishing our own souls a bit. And yoga is, is sort of, people seem to be looking within. But uh, in, in, in India, you weren't allowed to sit in the yoga position until you had mastered ahimsa, which was non-violence to both to every single uh, creature, plant or animal, or to human beings. And until your, it took six months to achieve that, and until your guru was satisfied that you had this complete uh, respect and awe for every single creature, that you were not allowed even to sit in the yoga position. And so Islam as well is, it, I mean, originally Islam was a much more nature-based and nature-respectful religion than, than we think of it today. Yes, and, and that's really remarkable when you think that the prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, was living and working in what, we, what is now Saudi Arabia in that absolutely in, Mecca. in, in that appalling climate. Um, and the Arabs of the time had no time for nature. Uh, because they were all half starved, uh, the, 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 the hideous environment, they, it could, they could not produce enough food for everybody, so they're always having to fight one another uh, to, to get, they're all on the brink of malnutrition. But the Quran uh, sees nature as uh, equal a revelation of the divine as the Quran itself. Um, and there are wonderful paeans of praise of nature in the Quran which we don't get in um, uh, the, uh, the translations. And it's very important to realize that we, people say, oh, well, I've read the Quran. Well, you may have read the Quran, but the point is you don't read the Quran, you listen to it. It's, um, it's, it's a chant that is extraordinarily mesmeric, uh, that has a beauty of itself. Um, I, I, I remember once, uh, years ago in the 80s, when I was in Israel, Palestine a lot, driving around with a lot of very rowdy young Palestinians around the West Bank in a car. Um, and they were drinking beer. These were not devout Muslims. But suddenly, the Quran came on the car radio. And these young men suddenly said, oh, Karen, I wish you could hear this. This is so beautiful. And they would try to translate it for me. It said it means this. And someone else would say, no, but it also means that because it has multiple meanings. So that when the prophet would uh, recite the Quran, and the word Quran means recitation. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 uh, he would be coming out with these paeans of, in praise of, of nature. Uh, in this hideous climate, but seeing it as an absolute marvel that every morning the sun rose and, the, and it would set at night and the wind would come and the moon would rise and, uh, in extraordinary beauty. And, and that, that has remained very close and important in, in, in uh, Muslim uh, spirituality, though of course uh, one doesn't really see that in Saudi Arabia today, it has to be said. No, and I, I mean, I was going to say we don't see it in Saudi Arabia and we don't see it in China as no. well, or um, no. in much in India, that the religions have been, in a way, overrode by a, a capitalism, right. if one wants to come up with something, or the fact that the West has said that the rigour of science is more important. I mean, that once you, I mean, it's a bit like the God delusion. Once you understand something, then you will never believe in an afterlife or anything. So you make the case, you know, that we have to refine this, this spiritual connection. But if the big religions of the world that definitely had it and understood it and were part of it are themselves now, uh, I'm mean, not backtracking, but not upholding that. Where do we go? Well, we've just got to start from somewhere. Um, I think. Uh, I, I think that. Uh, I think. I think uh, it is still the case, though, that that love of nature does remain in those religions, even among among ordinary people, um, if not their 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 their, follow, their lords and followers, uh, just as Indians still. Uh, put their hands to one another and bow to one another to acknowledge the sacredness they're experiencing in that. Uh, th th there is also that 
uh, that love of nature that was it was which we lost way back in the 16th century mm -hmm. that is still there but of course it's got over overlaid uh, with we we took we in Europe we took but in our empires we took uh, this new uh, this new contempt for nature really with us into the uh, into our colonies and 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 uh, it's uh, uh, it's it spread, but uh, we but still somehow we I don't I'm not saying that I, I still think it's there uh, in a way that it was not it's not necessarily uh, as accessible to us because we we abandoned it for a long long ago. Uh, but I think it, it is probably it will still be there in the in the chant. And as I say, there's an important Confucian movement in China at the moment, though I don't think they've got onto nature yet. But you you say, and you just used the word that uh, this is to play devil's advocate slightly. That you know yes. there is a contempt for nature, and yet you can look at um, the environment movements that you would say that people in the UK revere our natural landscapes. Uh, in America, you know, you, you have the natural parks, you have Yellowstone, you have all those places that were sort of set aside to be, to, to represent something about what, say, the Americans thought of their soul, which was the American West and the beauty, the natural beauty. So that is, that is there, but it clearly hasn't been enough. No. And are you saying that, I mean, unless unless the the sense of sort of all life in nature is sort of in, in born in you, born in your religion, it's something you cannot uh, just tap into? No, I think you I think you can. I think what we've got to try and do is to, as I've tried to show in the book, to recover some of the practices uh, that that uh, that gave us that gave people that sense of nature, like the Chinese idea of quiet sitting. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, quiet sitting, it, it means you don't, you sit, just sit quite calmly. You're not, not in the yogic position, no, you just sit quite comfortably. And, uh, but you listen and let nature, it, listen to the sounds, uh, look at the birds and the, and the, 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 the plants, just watch, let nature come into your mind because we don't do that now. I mean, today people are walking around in places of natural beauty, chattering on their phones, and they've got their their earphones on, and uh, and us, or else they take myriad photographs um, instead of being in the presence of nature in that quiet sitting way. We, we take millions of photos and, and, and have, prefer a virtual uh, view of nature rather than the thing itself. But with quiet sitting, just say, start off 10 minutes a day. Don't, don't, be, too, uh, don't be too ambitious because otherwise you, you just lose the plot. Uh, but start off 10 minutes a day, just sitting, turning off your phones, letting the sounds and, and views of nature and the sights of nature just enter our consciousness once or once a day. That's just one of the practices that I, I suggest. And then as things, as, as, as once you've got 10, your 10 minutes a day, you can put it up to 15 minutes a day, perhaps just, just or to 20 minutes a day, or just get into the habit of sitting in the presence of nature and letting its sounds and sights enter your consciousness and and, and recognize its beauty. I would say to that, that I, I don't, nobody would disagree, but have we got time? We've got to make time, I think. No, no, I don't mean time, say, personally. Oh, I, see. Yes. I mean, yes. time for a world to Good do goodness. something that it has spent, as you, you just, you said 1500, I mean, roughly that time, we spent five or 600 years doing precisely the opposite. And other great religions, maybe a le lot less, but they are also pursuing a very extractive path. Yes, and uh, look, uh, I am, look, I am no cockeyed optimist here. I'm, I'm not thinking that, you know, we'll, we can immediately change, turn things around. 
But unless we start getting nature into our head, minds and hearts and souls uh, in, in, in whatever way we can, we're going to go on in the same way that we have been doing. Because even what we may feel at the moment is, is, a great, is great fear, perhaps, and anxiety. But that doesn't necessarily, that fear and anxiety doesn't necessarily need to be productive uh, action. Um, so what we've got to try and do, uh, even at this late stage, uh, is to change our mindsets, just make ourselves more aware of nature. And I've suggested throughout the book various practices, not so that we are now going to love nature, you know, this day forward and um, we'll be uh, sleeping outside, be, uh, all that. No, just start simply and quietly and bringing nature back into our lives from which we have, uh, which have been, we've expelled it from our minds and hearts. How can we use the power of storytelling to do that? Because I'm very conscious when you read your book or you read some of the old, I mean, I've read a lot of the Hindu old stories that, they, that storytelling is so powerful and all the different forces in the world, they have a God and they have a representation and they have, ma they have their own magic, which you can rumble around with your head. And how can we use that? Because in a world that we live in, where we have reduced things to being very scientific, and that, you know, we look at charts in the newspaper showing the CO2 emissions or the number of hot days in Kent or, or whatever it is. There's this very sciencey approach to the disaster we're in. And it seems to me that we miss the storytelling element that might be a way you can capture and get people to have meaning. Yes. To to bring themselves into it in some way. Because I think, I think we all feel so powerless as well within this scientific story. But you see, I, that's why I think poetry can help us here. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, we haven't necessarily got these wonderful stories that the, that the other cultures have, because we've slightly laid them to one side since the 16th century. Did we have them though? Sorry? Did we have them? Uh, well, we, look at the fuss we make of St. Francis of Assisi. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, he's a sort of lone voice. Um, and um, and I, have, I have suggested that we uh, take St. Francis of Assisi's uh, great poem, The Canticle of the Sun, um, and, and, you know, you, you read or meditate on that. Uh, but we haven't got much of that uh, in our culture uh, in, in the West. Uh, though, so poetry can help us, I think. Um, you know, Wordsworth, we've just seen, but I, I give some more, more examples in, in the book. Um, just the, the beauty of the words, let them sink through us into our minds and hearts. And just, just for 10 minutes, uh, you know, it, it's no, uh, that, that's one, uh, one practice. Uh, it's no good saying, right, I'm going to do this from this day forward, because we just don't do that. We've just got to build up these, these habits. Uh, but I think, uh, I mean, there are wonderful poets, uh, Wordsworth himself um, uh, and Coleridge himself. Mm. Um, and Talk about know, the ancient mariner. And, the uh, ancient mariner and, and Frost at Midnight, yeah. that one, wonderful poem where he talks about the silence of nature with, with his son and, and uh, the frost performs a secret ministry, he says, and, and this, so that this isn't just a, a natural phenomenon. Uh, the frost has a ministry. Uh, it has a, a job of its own to do. It has a life of its own, which that doesn't mean we anthropomorphize it, but yeah. we recognize that it has a, a, its own life and its own sacrality and start being, become, poetry can help us, I think. We, we seize on, on, on our good, we've got some good poets and good modern poets too. Um, uh, I do think that we have anthropomorphized nature a great deal. And uh, sometimes I think that's a good thing. And sometimes I think that's not a good thing. What do you think? Oh, well, it, yes, uh, the, the point is we've got to see that the life of nature is different from our own. Um, you know, sometimes people talk to trees and things and they get the tree to talk back, but that is rather like being a ventriloquist. And I guess it, but the tree has its own um life 
and its own dignity. I've got a tree out there, you can't see it, but I look up from my desk and often during the day, especially in the winter time, this tree towering above, you see the life in that tree, the colors that change, the, the animals and creatures that come in and out of that tree. And you realize that that tree <coughs> has, it has its own distinct life um, that is holy because and the word holiness means separate, other from our own. Um, and that we should try and, and, and recognize that just as the frost has its own ministry uh, for Coleridge um, mm -hmm. and uh, to recognize that, to start look, looking at the, 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 the intense life of nature around us, which we can do in even in the middle of London. So I think it's very interesting now and are also very encouraging that in a way science or a lot of the people who are working on biodiversity solutions are now coming back to try to understand the way that indigenous people, especially people who've lived in rainforests and those areas, how they understand the life of the forest. And certainly when at the climate talks in Glasgow at the end of last year, there were large groups of indigenous people who had come and who, who there was one particular man who, who stood outside the gate and he was wearing this extraordinary headdress of orange feathers that came all the way down to the ground around him as though he was walking in his own arch of energy and protection. And it was an incredibly powerful symbol of, and also terribly sad because the thought that you had to cross the oceans in order to plead for your home, which was effectively what he was doing. So how do you, how do you see that we can learn from that? And as I say, I, I find it encouraging that science itself, our ruling God as such, is now saying, what can we learn, what can we do, and we must take heed of this. Does yes. it encourage you? Uh, yes. The trouble is, I think the, the, the indigenous people are so far ahead of us uh, that we've got to start off with baby footsteps. Um, it's, it's, it would be like going to, uh, you know, a, an, Ox, a, an Oxford dog. Uh, to teach, asking them to him to teach us how to read. Uh, we, we, because the indigenous people, and I have been doing some quite a lot of work on that recently, uh, is uh, they have their own extraordinary uh, relationship with nature, which is care. But we, I, I said that's too advanced for us. We have. I, so I went back to the uh, spirituality of the axial age of the, the Buddhists, the Hindus, etc., which are closer to us. Mm -hmm. But um, but we but still, let us, for goodness sake, uh, listen to uh, to the indigenous people, um, because uh, and and they there's you can't say that they that they each people has its own very distinct practices. Um, and some of them are, uh, in India, I mean, not in India, but in, in the Americas, for example, uh, that the uh, indigenous people on the West Coast had quite a different view of nature and a different policy towards it from the people on the East Coast. Um, but they, the, the reverence was the same, but the practices um, and and were, were, were very, very different. Uh, uh, all remarkable, all giving us something to teach, but we can't just say, let's be like the indigenous people because it, it, they're, mm -hmm. all, they're all different and each has its own particular genius, but let's listen to them um, by all means and respect them. But they, they're, it, it would be like trying uh, to, get, uh, to get a five-year-old into Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, to, to 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 do because we we are we have to take some baby steps um and we have but we have uh it, it's nevertheless we there are things that we we have learned from in our uh what i call axial age spiritualities mm -hmm. confucianism Taoism, etc uh hinduism uh, and buddhism too even buddhism which buddhism didn't start off as nature inspired but they they came into it. Uh, they 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 got it, and they um, developed their own view of sacred nature. Uh, so we can. They they are closer to us, uh, and 
baby steps are what are required uh, for us. And they, they can help us. But then we, we, we but, but also, I mean, I, my, uh, Ameri my Canadian editor spends a lot of time with indigenous people out in, in Africa, but she's noticing that some of them now have mobile phones and things. So, you know, the, all, the evils of the West are even creeping into some of these communities too. Yes, and I'm sure you're right that that uh, that what you call the evils of the West, but we have to somehow accept that there will be mobile phones, but we also have to be able to see the nat nature as sacred and as much part of ourselves. So just make a habit every day, just taking, closing down the phone for 10 minutes, first of all, you may get all kinds of jittery feelings, but and listen to nature, just to start off with, just as a, a, to kick off. Um, but also we can do things with our mind. Um, I, you know, I mentioned the, the, hope, the Chinese idea of concentric circles yes. uh, to that you start off with, uh, you know, yourself, but you move out further and further away from the self. And also, as the Chinese say, but to nature, reach out to, to the natural world, uh, a, a sort of men, a sort of as a meditation. Because very often in our so-called meditations or, or yoga, to, it, it, it's very much inward. Uh, mm. Whereas, as, as I've said, the Buddha achieved enlightenment by looking out. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting distinction. We have to look out too. Um, and there, there are some prayers. There's, uh, there's a prayer attributed to the Buddha. I can't say it all, but I, it's in the back of the book uh, where uh, some forest people come up to the Buddha and say that we can't do this yoga, you know, we haven't got time and, and, and we're, we're not clever enough. And he says, don't worry, Parliaments, just listen, take this poem. And it starts, let all beings be happy. Mm. Of high level, or of low, let them all be perfectly happy. Let our loving thoughts reach out above, beyond. So uh, uh, it's an exercise of the mind. It's a, it's a, quite a simple little little uh, poem uh, that we, where you are taking yourself out of ourselves, our own preoccupation, our own spirituality, and out into the natural world as well as into the uh, human world that is beyond us, the, uh, the, 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 the human world where people are now suffering greatly from, from uh, the, our environmental catastrophes. So, yes. So that there are things we can do with our minds that are not going to break us or, 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 or that are not too ambitious, that can just start off to lay seeds of a different mindset. And we can teach our children the same. How, yes, okay, so we're going to come to some questions because I suddenly realize we've got loads of them. First one here, the top of the list, uh, it's slightly taking us into a different track, but I'd be also, really interested in your answer from Tim Haggiard. When governments do cost benefit analysis, they never give an adequate price for the natural world. Would it be counterproductive to price in the environment to inform our decision making? Or would it be a step forward? Good or bad thing? Would it be, what, what, what is he suggesting? price in um, the natural world. So the sort of work that Pata Dasgupta does on saying there is a, if we can't if we can't protect the environment because we love it and we know that we need to if we gave it a price oh would that yeah. be a good thing to do I th I, again it would start us off thinking about the environment in, in a different way pushing us into a different mindset and it might give us a bit of a shock which is not not be a bad thing um so i think that's quite a good idea i think it, you know i think it, it, it anything that makes that makes us suddenly aware of nature, even if it's uncomfortable, we, uh, uh, then uh, it, it's, it's worth it because we are in a, a terrible mess. And, and uh, as Tim, I think, is, is saying, you know, we have taken all of it completely for granted and assumed it is free. Uh, yes. Fish, yes. Exactly. Air, water, soil, all yes. of it. Yes. Okay, a question here from Sarah Snyderman. Do you see a connection between subduing nature and subduing women in the holy books of religion, such as Christianity and Judaism? Um, let me think. Um, 
they could be, they, they could well be, I suppose. If, and if you look at the, the story of the fall, Eve comes out of that very badly. You know, it's poor old Adam that sort of got, you know, and Milton sort of makes that point that, you know, that she, she's the one who, who is, 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 the, is the one who listens to the serpent mm -hmm. and, and then sets, sets into, into mm -hmm. being not only the sin in the world, but also the collapse of nature. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> that, that, that there is, there is some, probably something in that. Um, as, as, uh, and, um, <clears throat> and with men being so sort of, uh, you know, powerful physically um, in terms of, you know, uh, their, their ability to work and fight, etc. cetera, uh, also fighting, fighting with nature too. Um, and, um, but using our, the male dominance to suppress nature as, as, as women were have been suppressed too. Um, I, that, that, that's a very interesting thought. I hadn't, I hadn't made that connection at all, but I think there's something in that perhaps. Thank you very much for the question. Now a question here from Denise Walton. Deism, God the divine mechanic, was evidently quite predominant during the enlightenment. Now I know you write about this. James Hutton, for example, the Edinburgh based father of geology was a deist. His theory of the earth is considered a testament to deism. Do you think that that had a lot to do with the enlightenment as the seedbed of the rapacious nature of the industrial revolution and our ongoing attitude to nature as a servant? Yes, definitely, I think, but very definitely. Uh, because uh, the, what's interesting in the, uh, China, the other, the Chinese, the Indian uh, and other uh, is, is that this is, the, the, this, this force is not dominant. This force is, uh, is, is very, very gentle and passive and uh, it's active, but it's active, but in a silent, uh, unobtrusive way. Uh, the Tao is our mother, says, uh, says Tao Te Ching. Um, and uh, so it, it, it goes out and it gives rather than it imposes. Um, that that's that's very, a very important aspect of this chi. It's neither feminine nor masculine, but it has got a lot of of of, of what we would call typically female attributes there, um, uh, and it's not something that is dominant. Uh, that it has to it has to emerge, uh, and with vulnerability too. There's. The, there's a, a, I've mentioned the Muslim mystic Ibn al-Arabi, who, who was a very fine, who, uh, very fine theologian, um, and also had great respect for women. But uh, he also sees the, the, the divine bringing the world into existence with a sob, a great heartfelt wrenching sob uh of sorrow and, and 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 sympathy for the creatures of the world uh that is that is and it wasn't just something that happened once uh he says that sob is continually uh in in play uh it, it's a, it's an eternal sob uh mm -hmm. that uh, brings brings the world into being which is a, 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 a rather feminine view of god we don't often think of our God as, as one who is sobbing. Yes, I've, I've always thought, I mean, as a feminist, that it's the fact that we have a male God is a very, is a very difficult thing. You know, and just he, how, he, ingrained, how ingrained it is in, you know, yeah. from the moment you're, you know, you're at the communion, <laughs> or the, you know, you're being christened, it's, it's God the Father. Um, and, you know, in, in the uh, Jewish scriptures, he, he is a dominant. Uh, yeah. Uh, father too. Uh, he's, you know, and I, I make I make that that clear. Except uh, the, as I point out in the Book of Job, where uh, which is, uh, and I say Job who is not one of the great prophets of Israel should become a prophet for us today, because he has to learn uh, that you know he's not the, the humans are not the center of the world, 
mm-hmm. and uh, to admire just the absolute beauty and extraordinary power of the animals uh, that God has created and, and the extraordinary power of nature. Uh, but uh, but with but with he just does it with a rather feminine sob when he he realizes uh, and he puts that that he has been at fault uh, to to lay aside all that domination and and uh, mas- un- masculinity is would be good. Great. I have a question here from uh, Duncan on any comments on Japan's Shinto religion, which heavily grounded in nature and still seems an important element of modern Japanese society. I haven't talked about Shintoism much uh, in the book, no. But certainly, that certainly, I would say, definitely, that is that is that is that is there, um, and their 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 view of nature, and you see it in their pictures and in their uh, their, their their whole their whole spirituality and artistry. Uh, that that along with the Chinese too, that that, that feminine aspect is is there. Um. Someone who's not who's not got their name. Um, would you have recommendations for practices which would help us recover the physical connection and relationship to nature? Ancient spiritual practices were inherently embodied due to the simplicity, and at the same time the harshness, as you mentioned about, say, being Arabs and at the time of uh, the Prophet, of lifestyle. So nowadays we're very insulated and isolated from elements, and we hardly touch the soil with our hands. So. It's a very good question that I mean do you should you go out into nature I mean you talked about a tree outside your window um do you go and sit by that tree I can't it's it, 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 it's in it no the, the tree is in 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 a in a the, the school grounds okay. but can you do this from your sofa as such uh, well I know what I do is I go and sit in my garden right. uh, which there and listen to the sounds of nature yes I think that that is to make us to put ourselves in touch uh, and to see just just to watch the the birds the flowers the the, the insects uh, the, the, the life there uh, yes uh, and I, I think we are just just to spend a, a good 10 minutes a day first and, and that becomes part of one's uh, consciousness, but then you can extend it to 15 and then 20 or else do it twice a day. Uh, so, or even when you're just walking down the street to see see the birds or even squirrels running down my, my street here in the middle of London. So uh, uh, yes, just, just, but just to keep uh, the mind open to nature instead of just putting our earphones on. I've got another question here from Sarah Snyderman about anthropomorphizing nature. Um, She asked, where's the line between doing that, anthropomorphizing nature, and seeing that other living beings may have social, emotional, and moral aspects of their own behavior? Absolutely crucial. Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, Holiness, uh, the word holy means otherness. And uh, we're not supposed to sort of humanize nature but to see that each natural thing has its own distinctive uh, life that is not like is not like a human, either female or male. Um, it, it, it has its own, and, and I think to accustom ourselves to the otherness of nature, that the word holiness means comes means other. Uh, in in it that was the original thing, and I think. If we try to focus on the holiness of nature, it's, other, it's neither male nor female. We mm-hmm. must be imposing our, our, gen, our genders uh, or our uh, human, humanity on nature, but let it become aware that it's got its own life, which is quite different from ours. Uh, I was very interested in, in your book. Um, I mean, there's lots and lots of interesting pieces, but this reminded me of the, the bit you write about sacrifice. Mm. and about how the sacrifices, I think of the Mayans or the Incas, how they would, how they treated an animal that was going to be sacrificed. And it was, I wondered if you could could just share that with the audience, because it's quite extraordinary compared to how we have 8 billion animals right now in cages waiting for us to eat them. Exactly. I mean, uh, and people all thought how cruel sacrifice Mm. was, you know, when you got 
millions dying in our abattoirs every day. No, the, the word sacrifice comes from sacrum facere, which means to make holy. Um, and uh, so the, uh, in India, where we, we, where we have the strongest view of this, it was really thought best. Uh, they would ask uh, a, a, a patron, a lay person, would say he wants to perform a sacrifice. Um, and he would have to undergo a long um, apprenticeship. He didn't just pop up and you know, let's do it on Friday afternoon like that. Months he spent, he had to be reborn as a god because sacrum, he had to make himself holy, sacrum facere. Um, and he, he had to, to, to live, live in this hut. He had to learn to uh, move like a, a fetus in the womb because as he was, as he was being born as a god, uh, he had to wear the clothes of the God, have his hair cut like a God, and let go of the self. Um, and the, it was the Indians just had decided by this time that it was really better if, if you, when you came to the point of killing the animal, that you just let it go. And you it could go and, and give it to one of the priests where it could live out its days. If, however, the, the patron insisted uh, on, on Go, on going ahead, the animal was uh, it was it was uh, sacralized, was treated with utter respect. Uh, it was washed, it was bathed, um, and then they put a, a, a noose around its neck and did it very very quickly. Uh, but as I say, usually it was thought best not to kill the animal at all. And in in and and I believe in Greece, they had a a, a a custom of if when the animal had been cut, its throat had been cut, they would throw the knife into the sea to have it to, so that it could drown as a punishment for what mm -hmm. it had done to the animal. So that it 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 was not a question of uh, uh, just parceling off these animals. It was, it was seen, the animal was, was seen as absolutely sacred. It too had become a sacred being and gone to the gods. And uh, it, it, it was mourned. The only, it was the, really the only way that uh, most people could eat red meat. When you ate red meat, uh, it was mostly stuff that was sacrificed uh, rather than, you know, sending people off, they didn't have the, uh, sort of abattoirs as to, that we have, have today. Uh, but most of the common people couldn't do that. I mean, the, the, it was only the elite who could attend these great big uh, sort of posh sacrifices. Uh, but the Indians showed ways in which every single person, however poor, a villager, however poor, could make something holy. And so every day, uh, they would be asked to put out food and water for anim passing animals. Um, they had to honour every single person who came into their house or home, whether they liked them or not, as though they were gods, treating them with respect, bowing with them, feeding with them, uh, honouring them. And you had to spend uh, time in what they call scripture study. And that did not mean Bible study in our sense, it meant that you sat in a quiet place and looked at the horizon, uh, let the sounds and signs of nature enter your head and recite a hymn uh, to make your life and, and other people holy, animals, birds, uh, vis and visitors, however unwelcome. Thank you so much. Um, we're now right up to time, but someone called Molly, sent in a question ages ago, right at the beginning of the talk. And it says, would you kindly reread the beautiful Wordsworth quote? I don't think you were reading it. I think you were just saying it. So maybe you could just say it again for us at the end of our hour together. Yes, and it's from Tintin Abbey, if you want to look it up. Uh, the uh, lines composed on uh, near Tintin Abbey. Well, I have learned, he says, to look at nature not as in the hour when he was a youth, a youth when he just was filled with exuberance for it, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity. 
nor harsh, nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. Karen, thank you so very, very much. And thank you very much for spending time with us this evening. This is this wonderful book. I cannot recommend it too highly. Um, thank you for all your wonderful questions. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but um, we'd be here all night, which I would enjoy, but I suspect people have to go. So um, we'll see you all again soon. We've got lots of 5 by 15s coming up. Karen Armstrong, thank you very, very much for sharing your extraordinary thoughts and wisdom and knowledge with us. And uh, thank you for writing this book and for being you. Good and night. Thank, thank you. It's been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you.